Welcome to today's presentation titled Transitioning to Blenderized Tube Feeding Inpatient Outpatient Settings and Insurance Coverage. My name is Katherine Bennett and I practice blenderized tube feeding in the outpatient setting at Chalk Children's Hospital in Orange, California. I am delighted to be here today to share my experience with blenderized tube feeding with you. With the continued popularity of blenderized tube feeding, we all likely have more experience and are more comfortable with it. This includes knowing better how to transition from commercial formula to blenderized tube feeding, use of blenderized tube feeding in various healthcare settings, as well as insurance coverage of commercial blenderized tube feeding products. We will review all of this in today's presentation. So let's get started. Here are the objectives for today. We will review how to transition a patient from commercial formula to blenderized tube feeding. We will understand the principles of blenderized tube feeding in various settings for adults and pediatric patients. And we will review insurance coverage guidelines for commercial blenderized tube feeding products. Transitioning from commercial formula to a blenderized diet is very much on an individual basis. It is important to find out what works both for the patient and the caregiver. For example, how much time and ability do they have? How much of a blenderized diet do they want to do? Are they currently happy with their formula regimen or do they need or want a change? I also like to assess the patient's nutrition history and most importantly, their tube feeding tolerance. Many times patients and caregivers have experienced such severe feeding intolerance that they're really nervous about changing their feeding regimen yet once again. If a caregiver or patient has had a history of tolerating their tube feedings without many issues, I typically recommend starting by replacing one commercial formula feed with a blenderized tube feeding on the first day and continue to replace one commercial formula feed with one blenderized tube feeding every one to two days as tolerated towards the goal. Remember, the goal may not be 100% blenderized tube feeds, so it's important to establish the goals with the patient and caregiver first. If a caregiver or patient is very nervous or perhaps has experienced severe feeding intolerance in the past, for example, having tried several different formulas or regimens without much success, I do recommend going slower. This may be starting with single ingredient foods that can be pureed and given as snacks in between the formula feedings. It also may mean that we start by replacing only half of one commercial formula feed with a blenderized tube feeding and advance every three to five days or weekly instead. When transitioning from commercial formula to blenderized tube feedings, I try to keep everything else the same except for the quote unquote food that we're giving the patient. For example, I encourage them to continue their same GI medications, their same water intake if deemed appropriate, their same tube feeding schedule, and their same pump volumes and rates. I tend to match the caloric density of the blenderized tube feeding with their formula to make it an easier transition. Once we are comfortable on a blenderized tube feeding diet, we can then discuss changing some things if the patient or caregiver desires. For those patients who've not had any food in their life and have only been on formula, I like to ask if there's any food allergies or intolerances in the family. This can help guide what ingredients you will recommend the patient start with. In continuing on with our discussion on how to transition from commercial formula to blenderized tube feeding, there is no magic formula or number. As I mentioned before, it is very individualized. I find that it's easier to transition a bolus tube fed patient than a continuous pump fed tube fed patient. With bolus tube feeding, you're essentially just replacing the patient's formula with blenderized tube feeding. As I mentioned earlier, I try to match my recipes to be the same caloric density as the formula, so it's a one-to-one -one replacement. And this can make for a simpler or easier transition. For example, if a patient's getting 240 mLs of a 30 cal per ounce formula, I will use a 30 cal per ounce blenderized tube feeding recipe and have the patient transition to 240 mLs of blenderized tube feeding from the 240 mLs of the formula. With continuous pump feedings, there are a variety of ways to transition. Sometimes it can be quite a math challenge. In my practice, I have found the following three ways to be the most common ways I transition. We can first start by doing only night feedings of commercial formula and start daytime blenderized tube feedings. Or we can hold the commercial formula for two to four hours and give bolus blenderized tube feedings during this time. Or we can stop the continuous um, commercial formula completely, mix the commercial formula with blenderized tube feeding and give over two hours. 
So how do we assess if a patient is tolerating the transition from commercial formula to a blenderized tube feeding diet? Well, here are a few things I look for. First, I ask families to know anything outside of a patient's baseline. This means, are they more irritable than usual? Stools, are they changing dramatically? Do we notice increased gas? Um, any skin changes like a rash, for example, or general, any general discomfort out of the ordinary? It isn't very common that we see intolerance to blenderized tube feeding, but sometimes there's some temporary constipation or gas initially during transition. This is why I found it's best to go slow at first, and I tell my families that just like I wouldn't recommend someone change their diet, specifically increasing their fiber intake a great deal in just one day, I wouldn't recommend this for my patients transitioning to a blenderized tube feeding diet. If any of these issues last longer, then we need to investigate. And of course, if any severe reactions occur, I recommend we stop and return to the previous tolerated regimen. During transitioning from a commercial formula to a blenderized tube feeding diet, if a patient is well nourished, I tend to worry less about meeting 100% of macronutrient needs during the transition. I do assure parents or patients or caregivers that for the few days we will be for the few days during transition that we will be below, we could be below goal calorie or protein, um, and this will be just fine. If we do try to meet 100% of the calorie protein needs, sometimes it can turn into quite a complicated math problem and thus a feeding regimen, and I tend to not like to put myself or the families through that. Of course, if a patient is malnourished or plans to take more than one to two weeks to transition to a blenderized diet, then we do need to do this math problem and find a way for them to meet their nutrition needs during this transition. I always like to make sure a patient's fluid needs are being met during transition. This can help with tolerance, specifically preventing um, any constipation or worsening of constipation. Commercial blenderized tube feeding products can be great options for a family who may be more anxious about transitioning or even a family who doesn't really have the time to prepare a home blend or deal with a complicated transition regimen. A commercial blenderized tube feeding product can alleviate some stress with preparation and allow a patient or caregiver to focus on the transition instead. And lastly, I always encourage my families to have frequent follow-ups with me. I tell them that I want to set them up for success if they are motivated to be on a blenderized tube feeding diet, especially during the initial phase of transitioning from a commercial formula to a blenderized tube feeding. Now we'll move on to how blenderized tube feeding is used in various patient care settings, such as inpatient, long-term care, outpatient, and school. Let's start with inpatient care. There are many things to consider when assessing if you'd like to start blenderized tube feeding in the inpatient setting. First, asking if you need to offer a blenderized tube feeding option is a good start. Are patients being admitted and requesting they stay on their blends during their admission? Will you be providing them a blenderized tube feeding option or will you be allowing them to bring in their home blends? Something else to consider is if you'll be providing blenderized tube feeding to inpatients who have not previously been on a blenderized tube feeding diet. Lastly, will you be allowing patients to bring in their home prepared blends or will the hospital be providing it? Commercial blenderized tube feeding options are a great way to be able to provide blenderized tube feeding diets in the inpatient setting without having to prepare them from scratch. At Shock Children's, we currently allow patients to bring in their home blends. We also carry commercial blenderized tube feeding products and patients can choose to use these instead of their home blenderized tube feedings if desired. We currently do not prepare blenderized tube feedings for our inpatients. If you're considering providing blenderized tube feeding in the inpatient setting, I would suggest getting a copy of the Infant and Pediatric Feedings, Guidelines for Preparation of Human Milk and Formula in Healthcare Facilities. I had the pleasure of co-authoring a chapter on blenderized tube feeding with Sarah Tudor from University of Michigan. Our chapter provides a lot of detailed information on how to do um, various things, including establishing a scope of service, developing your policies and procedures, training staff, developing guidelines, and we provide examples of these as well. Most importantly, it is recommended to involve patients and families when developing an inpatient blenderized tube feeding program. So perhaps you've decided that you will now be offering blenderized tube feeding in the inpatient setting. So now, how do you choose what patients will receive blenderized tube feeding? Lisa Epp from Mayo Clinic published a really nice article in Support Line in 2019 on what types of patients could be more or less appropriate for blenderized tube feeding. Table three on this slide reviews this in detail, and I also suggest you check out her article.
I've highlighted some key points here listed on the slide. Patients must be medically stable, not in the ICU, fed into the stomach, and tolerate bolus feedings. Will you allow blenderized tube feeding for inpatients who are new to tube feeding, or will you only allow outpatients established on blends to receive blenderized tube feeding when they're inpatient? I touched on this during the previous slide, but you do need to decide what you will offer patients who are on a blenderized tubing at home and then get admitted to the hospital. Will you allow them to use their home blends or will you provide them with a hospital prepared or a commercial blenderized tube feeding option instead? Now let's, moving on. let's move on to discuss blenderized tube feeding use in the long-term care setting. You will likely be addressing many of the issues as in the inpatient setting, including deciding if your facility will be preparing blends or providing a commercial option. It may be easier to start blenderized tube feeding in a long-term care setting than in the inpatient setting, since there's usually longer length of stay, lower acuity, more time for education, troubleshooting opportunities, but also more eyes and ears to assist with any challenges or issues. Quality of life is an important factor in long-term care, and it can be beneficial for tube-fed patients to have a sense of normalcy when it comes to their diet. So using blender as tube feeding can promote more of a normal meal time and eating pattern. Again, it is important to assess the patient and caregiver's ability to provide blends in the long-term care facility, as well as at home when they're discharged. For example, are they motivated or do they have the time and resources? Lastly, if a commercial blenderized tube feeding option is used, it is important to have appropriate documentation of its use, including rationale for use and tolerance, for example, in order to be successful in getting insurance coverage. Let's move on to the outpatient setting. This is a setting I'm most familiar with since it's where I currently work. It technically is the ideal place to start a new blenderized tube feeding. Patients are stable since they're at home, they have access to their food as well as their own supplies and equipment. It's highly recommended that a blenderized tube feeding be started by a dedicated and knowledgeable registered dietitian nutritionist. Notice I didn't say experienced. This, be, this is because if a registered dietitian nutritionist is dedicated and resourceful, but doesn't yet have quite the experience with blenderized tube feedings, they are still a great resource in ensuring a patient transitions to a blenderized tube feeding diet successfully. In the outpatient setting, it's also important to have a dedicated caregiver providing the blenderized tube feeding, as well as support from the healthcare team. Having support from the healthcare team can help ensure compliance to a blenderized tube feeding diet, as well as compliance to coming to follow-up visits and reaching out if any problems occur. If a patient doesn't have healthcare team support, they may be fearful or even angry about it, and this could lead to noncompliance or being lost to follow-up. In the outpatient setting, we must provide the caregiver and patient tools for success on a blenderized tube feeding diet. This includes a lot of education on nutrition goals, food choices, food safety, as well as help with resources like proper equipment and supplies. We must also be cognizant of a patient and caregiver's time to be able to provide a blenderized diet, as well as their ability to follow up. Does a blenderized tube feeding diet work for their schedule, their life? Do they have time to prepare it correctly? Do they understand the importance of regular follow-ups? If there are concerns regarding a patient's ability to prepare and maintain a home blend, a commercial option may be a better option. Lastly, we must make sure we appropriately document the use of any commercial blenderized tube feeding if we are seeking insurance coverage. This again can include, include type of product, rationale for use, history of other formulas trialed, tolerance and quantity to meet a patient's nutrition needs. Now let's discuss blenderized tube feeding in the outpatient clinic setting. In my experience, many speech, occupational and feeding therapists are recommending blenderized tube feeding. They are seeing the benefits of blenderized diets over commercial formula, specifically increased interest in eating by mouth. I love working with therapists as they are truly another set of eyes and ears for my patients on blenderized tube feeding. Many times they are seeing the patients weekly or more often than I am and can report back to me or another healthcare provider if things aren't going well for a patient on blenderized tube feeding. This allows us to intervene sooner and avoid a worsening situation. I have been encouraging our therapists to ask the family to follow up with me or if their doctor, if it's been greater than six months um, since they were last seen by either, if the patient has had visible weight loss or not growing um, as we'd like them to, or are declining in their therapies because of this, if the parent expresses concerns about nutrition, diet, or tolerance to the diet, 
or if the therapist has concerns about safety of the patient's blenderized tube feeding diet. I was once contacted by one of my patient's feeding therapists who was working with our patient and noticed that the parent had brought a home prepared blends to their visit that was not in a cooler with an ice pack. The therapist reached out to me and I was able to contact the family to discuss proper food safety and storage methods. I also encourage therapists to defer any nutrition recommendations or advice to a registered dietitian nutritionist. If their patient on a blenderized diet is asking them about specific foods or calorie goals, I do recommend that they ask the patient to get in touch with their RDN and avoid giving them any specific recommendations. Lastly, I encourage therapists to seek out education on blenderized tube feeding and learn more about it. This can help them not only understand how and why a patient or caregiver may choose to do a blenderized diet, but also evaluate their patients for any concerning issues and share these with the rest of the patient's healthcare team. We are now on to our final setting where blenderized tube feeding can be found, school. A fabulous resource is the article by Mandy Corrigan and other experts from Aspen, the Oli Foundation, and the Feeding Tube Awareness Foundation titled Resources for the Provision of Nutrition Support to Children in Educational Environments, published in Nutrition and Clinical Practice in 2017. In addition to this article, they even have developed a great toolkit with supporting information and resources on providing nutrition support in the educational setting. In my experience, each school can be different in their practices and policies. I have families who have access to a health aid that can help with a child's tube feeding at school. I have other families where parents go to the school to give their child a tube feeding. A child's individualized education program, also known as an IEP, or their 504 plan should include nutrition and more specifically blenderized tube feeding. It is important that updated physician's orders and notes be kept on file at the school and ideally these notes document a child's blenderized tube feeding diet regimen. It may even be helpful to have the RDN's notes as well. I have provided updated nutrition summaries or recommendations to many families who have requested such a thing to provide to their school to supplement the physician's notes and orders. It is also very important to have a G-tube troubleshooting tips, emergency kit, and a plan for what happens if the G-tube is clogged or comes out. This is important with blends as there is an increased risk, although we don't see it as often as we thought we would, for tube clogging due to increased viscosity of a blenderized diet. A common regimen for many of my blenderized families is to continue use of commercial formula or use a commercial blenderized tube feeding product at school and reserve homemade blenderized tube feeding use for at home. This can help keep things simple and alleviate any issues with the school having concerns over giving blenderized tube feeding or any potential problems administering it. I have had some families share with me that their schools prefer one method of tube feeding over another. This plays a role in blenderized tube feeding as it is usually too thick to be given through a gravity feed and must use a pump or a syringe with a plunger. Lastly, it is important that families doing blenderized tube feeding label and date their blenderized tube feedings, not only at home, but especially for school. This can help assure that the child gets the correct feeding and amount, but also can help assure school personnel of what they are administering. I also encourage families to choose a formula for backup. This could be a commercial formula or a commercial blenderized tube feeding product that the school could administer if and when a home blend is not available. For the last slides of the presentation today, we will be reviewing insurance coverage of blenderized tube feeding. Home prepared blenderized tube feeding and the equipment used uh, to prepare it are not covered by insurance. It's important to assess your patient's ability to be able to afford the food and equipment to prepare a home blend. The actual cost of home prepared blends do vary greatly and it can depend on if you're shopping at a discount food store versus shopping at a farmer's market versus shopping at Whole Foods, for example. Home blenderized tube feedings don't have to be fancy, and I always try to work with my families to ensure we have a plan that is both nutritionally sound and affordable. Commercial blenderized tube feeding products can be covered by most insurance plans under HCPCA code B4149. However, Medicare and many private insurance policies require failure of a standard formula. All formulas trialed and failed must be documented clearly. It's a good idea to review an insurance plan's enteral nutrition coverage policy or review the reason for denial if a product is denied. This can help ensure the correct and specific documentation to optimize insurance coverage. Medicaid coverage can vary from state to state. Currently in California, where I live and work, commercial blenderized tube feeding products are not covered by Medicaid, unfortunately. I definitely hope this changes in the near, in the near future.
It is important to know that if insurance doesn't cover, patients and caregivers can purchase commercial blenderized tube feeding products out of pocket as no prescription is needed. Lastly, regardless if insurance does cover a commercial blenderized product, availability may be an issue. Some home infusion companies do not carry these products, so it's not only finding out if insurance covers it, but also finding a home infusion company that, that carries it and will allow a patient to successfully start on a commercial blenderized tube feeding product. The commercial blenderized tube feeding uh, companies can provide a lot of help with insurance issues, as well as provide um, home infusion companies uh, that carry their products. I'd now like to review some insurance coverage best practices. Again, I recommend documenting all tube feeding intolerance information, formulas trialed, and do this in medical notes, not a letter. It is best done at each visit and updated over time. Again, commercial blenderized tube feeding product coverage may require documentation of failure of standard formulas before coverage is even considered. So common failure or intolerance symptoms to justify blenderized tube feeding coverage include the following, allergies, constipation, diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, reflux or GERD, gagging or retching, and lack of weight gain. It is also important to document tolerance to a blenderized commercial uh, product if a patient has trialed it and is doing better on it than previous formulas. This can help further support the need for a commercial blenderized tube feeding product over a standard formula. The commercial blenderized tube feeding companies will provide samples to trial for tolerance, and I do this often with my patients before submitting for insurance coverage request. Real Food Blends has some nice information on insurance coverage, so I encourage you to check out their website listed here on this slide. In conclusion for today, I hope you better understood that transitioning to blenderized tube feeding diets can be an individualized process and requires close monitoring by a registered dietitian nutritionist, but also the healthcare team. Also, commercial blenderized tube feeding products are a great option in many care settings, especially the inpatient and long-term care settings, and can be covered by insurance with appropriate medical documentation. And lastly, we all play a role in the monitoring of our patient's blenderized tube feeding diet to ensure long-term success and health. I'd like to acknowledge that this educational offering was provided to you by Aspen, supported by an educational grant provided by Real Food Blends. I'd also like to thank Aspen and Real Food Blends for asking me to share my experience with you today. Also, please check out Aspen and its resources listed here. Thank you so much for attending today, and I wish you the best of luck in your blenderized tube feeding endeavors.